In the uplands of Pali, there were once sacred hail, the spring brought forth by the god Kani, and a pair of kufua who would watch over the valley. Today we bring you to Kalihiuka on this episode of Hawaii's Most Haunted. Beyond the cool waters and trade winds of our idealistic paradise is the thin veil which separates our world from the place where the shadows talk back. Welcome to Hawaii's Most Haunted. Kupua stones, or Pohapu Kupua, are stones that range in size from a pebble to a boulder that has either an odd shape or an odd feeling to it when someone with other than normal perception encounters it. These kinds of stones are said to be imbued with beings or shapeshifters whose duty it is to protect the area in which it is situated. Often, one will see sizable Pohaku on the side of a trail or a grassy medium just off the freeway that are decorated with flower lei or kuolo, normally a tea leaf bundle. It is a way of thanking the kukua for protecting the area and the people around. The gods Kane and Kanaloa journeyed along the coast of the island of Oahu until they came to Kali. For a long time, they've been looking up the hillsides and along the watercourses for ava. At Kalihi, a number of fine ava roots were growing. They pulled up the ava roots and prepared them for chewing. But when Kanaloa looked for fresh water, he could not find any. He said to Kane, our ava is good, but there's no water in this place. Where can we find water for this ava? Kane said, indeed, there is water here. With his long staff, he began to strike the earth. The point of his staff went deep into the rock, smashing and splintering and breaking open a hole out of which water leaked. Now they were able to mix their ava. This pool of fresh water has been known since the days of old as Kapukalai Okali. In this area where Kani brought forth the water, one pool was icy cold and the others were warm. It is said that Hawaiian mothers would bring their newborn babies to that spot and bathe them in the warm spring. Close to the edge of these flowing waters stood two stones about four feet tall that were said to have been placed there by Eepa. These stones were called Kapu and Kalai Ho'ola, and they were believed to be Kinolau of two Kupua goddesses. Strangers passing by were advised to braid a lei and place it on the stones so that they would not meet with trouble. They will encounter no mists and cold and will not get lost. Naughty children were blamed for dipping lehua ohia branches in the water and sprinkling the stones, causing the mountain to be covered with mist and a drenching rain to fall. Sometimes the naughty children would throw away the visitor's lay and the same thing would occur. In October 1953, two famous stones were completely destroyed by bulldozers when construction workers first cleared the area, approaching the Tao site for the Liki Liki Highway to be built. Hawaiians of the time believed that the destruction of these stones was probably the cause of the drought which gripped the island of Oahu during the fall months, 1953, and the heavy rains which had been falling the following summer that may have caused the Wilson Tunnel to cave in in 1954. Old Hawaiians during the time said that the only way to avoid further trouble would be to hold a proper ceremony to beg forgiveness for disturbing the sacred land belonging to Hawaii's ancient gods. The ceremony would include the offering of a particular black pig with a red stripe down the body, the Pua'ahiva Olomea, and a red chicken called Moa Ulahiva. There have been stories about the Wilson Tunnel being haunted since the first tunnel opened in 1958. People claim to have heard screams in the tunnel. Others have always gotten chicken skin while in the tunnel, where it felt so uncomfortable that they do everything they can to avoid driving through the tunnel altogether. In January 1954, excavation began on the tunnel that would connect Kalihi to Windward Oahu. The Wilson Tunnel would become a major artery through the Ko'olau mountain range. But almost immediately after construction began, the project was plagued with injuries. Two men were hospitalized in February after a jack slipped and hit them in the legs. Shortly after that, 
A number of injuries occurred from falling rocks while men were still working inside the tunnel. Six months after construction began, on July 9th, Lawrence Ani suffered a mild concussion when a troll fell on his head. He was confined to Queen's Hospital for a time and then released. The very next Saturday, July 10th, there was a massive cave-in. At least 15 and maybe as many as 20 steel rib supports collapsed in the cave-in. Workmen observed the supports buckling that morning and left the tunnel. The cave-in happened in the afternoon. While no injuries were reported, construction of the tunnel was halted for a while, almost a month. The city and the contractors tried to decide who was at fault and what the next step was going to be. For weeks, there was so much conflict between the construction company and the city as they argued as to who was liable for the added cost and extended time. Engineers were consulted and the area surveyed. It was a complete mess. One safety engineer claims that he foresaw the tunnel cave-in and noted several other safety hazards in an inspection of the tunnel three days before. The engineer's report noted imminent danger of landslide. It was forwarded to the president of the construction firm handling the project. Other hazards noted the poor housekeeping and repair shop and generator building. Accumulated water outside the tunnel entrance, excessive speed on the part of dumping equipment, unsatisfactory maintenance of the drilling rig. Quite a number of accidents have already occurred at the Wilson Tunnel, he said. And contrary to reports in the newspapers, at least one of them was an extremely serious injury. More than a week after the initial cave-in, the sinkhole was found on the mountain above the tunnel. Fear that excavation of the cave in the area would only open the way for more mudslides down into the tunnel caused further delays. Meanwhile, the mayor of the time continued to insist that the collapse of the tunnel would not be at the public's expense. He said, the study of the contract specifications has convinced him that the cave-in is not the responsibility of the city and that any extra costs must be carried by the contractor. Finally, one month after the initial cave-in, work on the tunnel resumed. The newspaper reports that extra cave-in precautions were being taken including the addition of permanent concrete linings to be installed and steel ribbing to now be at 18 inch intervals, as opposed to the previous three foot spacing permitted under the original designs. Heavy rains from the week prior had subsided, allowing the tunnel to dry a bit. Photos show the crew working to dig 4,500 cubic yards of mud and rock that now fill the tunnel for a distance of about 200 feet. More than 75,000 gallons of water a day streamed along the tunnel floor and out the Kaneohe entrance, adding to the difficulty of the process. At 5.30 a.m. on August 14, just four days after work resumed on the tunnel project, another cave-in took the lives of several men. Nine men were working that day. Manuel Govea, a mucking machine operator and father of four, said that dangerous landslides in the area they were working in indicated to him that a cave-in was imminent. He walked off the job and left the tunnel heading at 2 a.m. to the laughter of the other men. Govea said that they were working on a tunnel platform high up against the tunnel ceiling and were protected only by steel ribbing. He said landslides from the ceiling on three occasions dropped large sections of earth against the ribbing. On each occasion, the crew members ran down a ladder from the top of the platform and, after the slide, returned to their jobs. After the third landslide, Govea refused to go back to the platform and told his co-workers that he was quitting. They laughed and asked me if I was scared, he said. While only one man, Matthew Kaunohi, escaped uninjured, Lawrence Ani, who was also injured in July, the day before the first cave-in, was also there that day for the second collapse. Ani said he could hear steel cracking. He was closer to the front of the tunnel than the rest of the crew and said that he and another man took off running and ducked behind a large machine. The ceiling came down and Ani was pinned against the side of the tunnel by dirt and wood and steel. A large plank fell across his body and other planks were falling all around him. He couldn't move. He blacked out for a bit. And then when he came to, he saw a patch of light pulled himself out and started running. Later, Ani would state, 
that two escapes were enough for him, and he was quitting construction business for good. By the time rescue crews arrived, it was clear that one man, John Wright, was dead. Attempts to free him were hampered by a mass of steel ribbing and a cement mixer which had fallen around the man. Five other men were trapped in the mud. Rescue workers using shovels, saws, and acetylene torches dug 15 feet into the tunnel and another 15 feet down to rescue Albert Robillon. A fallen timber created an air pocket over his body, saving his life. One of the doctors on the scene said it didn't look good for the others. On August 18th, 1954, the story broke that exclaimed that there was another cave-in on July 28th that was kept secret. Since the tunnel was not being worked on and no one was injured, only the engineer, the construction company, and the mayor knew about the second cave-in, making the August 14th collapse the third incident. In a project that seemed to be plagued with incidents since it began, the heavy off-season summer rain that beat down on the Kotlaus were blamed for the tunnel collapse took the lives of five men. The rescue required scores of construction workers, city and county ambulance teams, Kaneohe police, and the fire department rescue squad. Friends and relatives of the trapped men maintained vigils outside the tunnel, praying that they would be reached in time. It took several hours for the bodies of the men to be found. Eighteen months passed before construction resumed and the first tunnel opened to traffic in October 1958. Have the Kupua been appeased? Do the spirits of these men still hover in the place where they lost their lives? Could the screams, the chicken skin, the uncomfortable feeling be attributed to the Kupua or the ghosts of these men? Alan Aquino was 49 years old and lived in Palama with his wife and eight children, whose ages ranged from 2 to 13 years old. Alan went to work at the tunnels on July 1st, less than six weeks before the collapse. 41-year-old Henry Lima of Waimanalo with his wife and five children. Henry started work at the tunnel in January of that year. John Wright was 32 years old and had recently moved his family from Kahuku to Hauula. He was married and had four children at the time of the tunnel collapse. John's six-year-old son, John Jr., was confined to Children's Hospital due to polio. John Sr. had been working on the tunnel for about six months. Reginald Kamanu of Kailua was 34 years old and had three children. According to his father, Reginald had been working at the Wilson Tunnel for about two weeks. Sam Kapokua of Palama was the only man on the list who didn't have children. At 21 years old, he was a veteran of the Korean War. Sam's job at the Wilson Tunnel was his first job after returning from military service. Not many people think about the blood, sweat, and tears that go into a construction project. Not many people outside of their families have thought about these five men who were only doing their job when tragedy struck. Folks, I'd like you to take a few seconds the next time you're passing through the Wilson Tunnels and say a prayer for the souls of these men and their families. This video was put together to honor them, to honor their work and their memory. Mom.